Good morning and thank you for joining today's webinar titled The Future of Independent Contractors in California. I am Denise Ketty, your moderator for this session, and I just want to go through a couple of quick housekeeping notes before introducing today's expert panel. The webinar will run about 60 minutes in total, and there will be time at the end of the webinar to address some of your questions. If you have questions during the presentation, please post them to the Q&A area on the dashboard at any time during the presentation. If you have a question that is directed to a specific panelist, you can note that, that when sending in your question. Please take a moment to visit the handouts area on your dashboard to download a copy of today's presentation. If you have any issues during the presentation, you can email me directly at denisemketty at gmail.com. Our webinar today is being recorded and all accompanying materials are protected by copyright. Our presentation today provides general information and doesn't constitute legal advice. The advice that is offered during the webinar is as of today, September 27, 2018. As always, we recommend that you consult with your own legal counsel to address your specific situation to ensure that you have the most current information on legal matters. Let's get to our session today the California Supreme Court decision in the case of Dynamics Operations West Incorporated versus the Supreme Court of Los Angeles County. The court created a new ABC test for determining whether workers should be classified as employees or independent contractors. The decision embraced a standard presuming workers are employees and placed the burden of proof on employers. Our legal expert today is Marla Merhab Robinson partner and head of the transactional department at Merhab, Robinson, Jackson, and Clarkson. Marla is responsive, reliable, and respected by her clients and peers. Marla and her team are unique as compared to other legal firms in that she and the members of her team have worked in the corporate world so they understand the challenges that you as business owners face on a daily basis in addition to understanding the legal concerns of your business. Our next presenter today would be Linda Duffy, president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. If you've been fortunate to, enough to work with Linda, you know how committed she is about developing strategies for business leaders to get the right people, systems, and culture in place for your organization so that you as a business owner can focus on your business to achieve your goals. That is what Linda refers to as the magic of human connection. Linda and her team at Ethos are strategic advisors helping business owners with human resources, consulting, recruiting, training, and payroll support. Her clients range from high-tech businesses to manufacturing firms to nonprofit organizations, and her team is well-versed in addressing the concerns of founder CEO-led businesses. Linda, can you get us started this morning? I can. Thank you so much, Denise, and welcome. Um, this is our agenda. You know, we've done webinars in the past on independent contractors with the Dynamex decision that came out a few months ago. Uh, we get a lot of phone calls about different situations. And while today we can't address every single scenario or situation, we are gonna spend some time having Marla walk us through the Dynamex decision, talking to us about the ABC test, and then I'm gonna be talking about some of the issues that we see and the costs if you misclassify people, because they can be, uh, pretty severe, give you some best practices, and then we also have a couple of scenarios we will address. And as always, we'll do our best um, to uh, answer your questions. So I'm gonna actually turn it over to Marla to get us started. Marla, if you can take us through the Dynamex decision and teach us a little bit about the court's thinking. I will do that. Thank you, Lynn. And I'm going to try and do it without coughing. I'm getting over a very bad cough, so I apologize in advance if I do start coughing. Um, just a little correction. The, the name of the case is Dynamex Operations West Inc. versus Superior Court, not Supreme Court of L.A., although L.A. thinks sometimes it's its own state. It's not. <laughs> okay, so the legal scholars here have been calling this case a game changer. It's likely to cause significant problems for us employers. It raises more questions than answers. On first blush, it sounds great. Oh my gosh, we're not gonna look at the 10 point test or the 21 point test. We're only gonna have a three point test. But unfortunately, the tests raise a lot of questions and we'll go through them. Um, that in the case was about two delivery drivers who brought a class action against 
Dynamax, which is a delivery company. And if you read the facts, I think under any of the old uh, tests, or, and some of the, the old tests are still applying, but under the old test, they, they likely would have fallen in the employee category as well. But the drivers claim that Dynamax misclassified them as independent contractors instead of designating them as employees. Um, the suit alleged that they that the company engaged in unfair competition and violated portions of the labor code and that those portions were related to um, expense reimbursement and of course if they were misclassified their wages the issue before the california supreme court was to determine the proper definition of independent contractor to be used for analyzing claims arising under the, the wage orders um, which you know the wage orders cover minimum wages overtime payments meal and rest breaks uh, Dynamex argued that the court should apply the familiar multi-factor test for determining independent contractor employees known as the Borello test. So the Borello test was adopted 30 years ago. So this is how long it's been since the court has looked at that. But with a little history, it, they were sliding towards this. And I want to just give you a little bit of that history. So Borello was um, farm workers who picked cucumbers, and um, they claimed misclassification in a workers' comp case. Workers' compensation claim uh, is how the case arose. And the Borello factors were then adopted, which were the primary factor was whether the person to whom the service is rendered has the right to control the manner and means of accomplishing the result desired. But then there were nine additional factors, so we call that the Borello 10 factors. Then after Borello, there was a case called Martinez, which was strawberry farm workers. And that case was about joint employment. The workers were claiming that not only the company that paid them for their work should be responsible for their wages, but also um, the merchants that bought their product. And Borella was used in that case as well. And then not too long ago, we had a case called Ayala, and that was about newspaper carriers, and that was a wage and hour claim. And while the case was pending, the court actually even put out to the attorneys in that case, are you sure you want us to use the Borello test? Is there another test you would like us to look at? And the attorneys said no. Both The attorneys on both sides said, we agree that Borello is the proper test. So the court did not look at it at that time and, and adopted that test. Well, in this case in Dynamex, the court took at issue the meaning of the term employ and specifically what it means to engage, suffer, or permit because that's what's in the wage orders, <clears throat> excuse me, of, for uh, that the claims for wage and hour would fall under. And the court said, that's what we have to look at. And we decided that we are going to adopt the ABC test. Now, two thirds of the states in the United States already use the ABC test. So the court is adopting something that's already been out there. And again, as I said, the court was suggesting in Ayala, should we maybe be leaning towards this? If you read the case, all 82 pages of it, um, it's very political in, in its discussion about we don't want the public to be required to bear the burden of payroll taxes and workers' comp and social security taxes. We, we really want to have the, the, the dollars of tax revenue of millions of workers that should be classified as employees and not independent contractors. I will tell you this case took 13 years to get to the California Supreme Court. And again, 82 pages, which makes it very difficult today to, to speak to everything. Um, and to Linda's point, we're not gonna obviously be able to uh, deal with every single worker you have and or that might be an independent contractor or an employee. So the one takeaway that we do know here is that the, the court made it very clear that this is the test when the claim is brought under the wage orders. It's not necessarily the test for common law claims, unemployment insurance claims, workers' comp claims, even expense reimbursement, because that's under the labor code and not under the wage order, which is really odd. I'm sure everybody would agree. And most legal scholars believe that it, ultimately they'll all get there. But right now, they, it, it, it is not there. Um, the, it's very clear that it only applies to claims under the wage order. So there's many, many resolved issues, and there's more questions than, than answers. So let's look at the test. First blush, it seems simple, right? Three items on the test, but it's unclear and hard to satisfy some of 
these, these questions as we'll show at the end when we look at some samples. It's the employer's burden of proof under the test. The first part of the test is that the worker is free from the control and direction of the hirer in connection with the performance of the work. And this means both under the contract for the performance, whatever is agreed orally or in writing, writing excuse me, of the work, and in fact, meaning what, what's really happening. Are, are you controlling? And this is what we're all used to. And I, I think uh, everyone who's used either the 21-point test for the IRS determination or the 10-point test from Borello, there's very often we go through that test and we it, we don't know. And the EDD has its own test as well. Um, theirs is a little bit easier because if you can answer some questions yes or no, they'll tell you we're going to automatically default it to an employee. And of course, like the money grab here, it's in the government's in best interest if the worker is defined as an employee. So this part of the test, it shouldn't be a big surprise to anyone because we've already had this. The second part becomes very difficult. And again, on first blush, seems very simple, that the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. That seems very simple. If I'm a lawyer and you're a cake baker, we have different businesses. However, it's not so simple if you had different facts. The court used e examples of a retail store um, where a plumber would come in to fix the bathrooms or an electrician would come in to fix the lights. The court actually used those examples over and over and over, um, making it very clear the court feels electricians and plumbers are definitely independent contractors. However, let me add a fact. Let's say you have a, a, a very large retail conglomerate like Target that has plumbers and electricians on its staff, and yet hire someone to come in to do a special job, to, to remove lights from somewhere that, that's beyond the capability of their electricians. Have we now changed that? Has that the same work that's being done by the employees of the, the hirer, does that negate item number B? We don't know. Because um, the court didn't go that far. It didn't have any detailed analysis at all. Um, I think that something that did come out of it that's clear, though, is it, the court is going to look at how the employer is defining its business. So in your your best practice is go back and look at your website and, and see how are you telling the world what you do? What is your usual course of business? What is it that you do? Like I said, the court's own conclusions lack any analysis that will help us here. So that's why this first blush simple item is not so simple. Um, the court did look to many other states' cases, and I think that's what we'll have to continue to do um, as we do our analysis for our clients, as we're going to have to dive into the other states because it's clear that that's what our courts are going to do. And the third prong, item C, is that the worker is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as the work performed for the hiring entity. So this is an area that the court left open for us to at least argue. If you have a, a worker that's coming in through a corporation or an LLC, uh, a, par a partnership or some other entity that's a separate business with a separate business license, then we may be able to argue that this case was individual workers. Those are entities. Now, the court did provide us some um, help here saying, you know, we do want to see here that you've taken the steps of that a business takes, incorporation, licensing if necessary, permits if necessary, um, working for other entities. So. They, we do have a little direction there that we've always had. Um, uh, we've always known that if, if, you, if you've got those factors where you're working for others and you've got capital invested in a company, that that would lean towards independent contractor status. Now, what's happened since April when the case came down? That's how recent this case was. We've actually had uh, four uh, reported cases and one non-reported case but was in the newspaper, an Orange County Superior Court case held that the Dynamax was retroactive because that was a question the court also left open. Generally, when the courts don't state when it's effective, it is retroactive, which is very difficult for employers as well. Um, and we've now had one court acknowledge that, a lower uh, Orange County Superior Court. Um, there's a case called C California Trucking Association versus Sue that held that the Federal Arbitration Act did not preempt state law in classifying independent contractors. So 
with respect to, to transportation industry, this test is going to apply, um, depending on whether the claim is brought under the wage orders or not. Um, we had a case called Curry versus Equilon that held that the, this test, the ABC test, did not apply or does not apply to determine whether an entity is a worker's employer for joint employer classifications. This is, you know, very good news for joint employers um, like staffing agencies and whatnot. This case arose out of service stations. A service station manager was uh, claiming a wage and hour uh, claim under the wage orders and was it was actually Shell, so the owner of the Shell station, and then she was also claiming a joint employer status with the Shell Corporation. But the court held that the Shell Corporation was not even engaged in the same business because they held it was a real estate and distribution business, <laughs> not a gas station. Then we had Salgado versus Daily Breeze. In, in a footnote, um, it stated that Borello may apply to one statutory scheme, but not another. So again, um, the ABC test for wage order claims and Borello, the 10 point test for workers' comp claims, um, unemployment insurance claims, and the like. Johnson versus Serenity Transport um, applied the ABC test for class certification on independent contractors. That was mortuary drivers, so another driver case. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Linda. Well, thank you so much, Marla. Um, I can only imagine how everybody on, on this webinar is feeling right now because my head wants to explode and I do this all day long. So I know you and I have had some interesting conversations over the last few weeks in preparation for this about how difficult it is for uh, everyone to apply these tests because it, there are so many different cases weighing in. Um, so what I want to talk about is some common misclassification problems. These are issues that we see come up all the time. And to us, these are the ones you know, that are just huge red flags if you have people misclassified. So I just wanted to point these out um, in case uh, you're doing any of these things, you might want to give that you know, a second thought. These are not the gray area ones as far as I'm concerned, and we will talk a little bit about some of those scenarios that we're all struggling with right now later. So the first one's outside sales reps. I see this over and over again with clients who call me or prospective clients who call me. We go in, we're going to do an audit of some kind. We're, we're talking to them, we're asking questions, and we get to, do you pay anybody as an independent contractor? And they say, yes, our outside sales reps are all independent contractors. And, you know, the, again, there are shades of gray, I should say, on some of these. Um, we've got a client that installs uh, window blinds. They, they want their outside sales reps to be classified as independent contractors. And although, you know, I have suggested that that probably is not the right classification that they're really employees they do rep various lines of products and so you know we're going to talk a little bit later about some of the steps you can take to make sure you're doing everything possible still not without risk but everything possible to uh, properly classify people but in this case you know outside sales reps if they're selling a product they're only selling for you they're not allowed to work for a competitor um, you know you're really controlling you know, the pricing and everything that they're doing, uh, that really is an employee situation. Another thing we see is a former employee working as a consultant. Had that happen recently with another client. They actually, in this case, decided to fire their controller and then they hired somebody else. That person quit after a short period of time. So they brought the old controller back but are paying that person as a quote-unquote consultant, even though he doesn't have his own business, they're paying him on his social security number on a 1099. Um, so not only that, if you skip forward to, um, you know, another line item here, paying somebody under a 1099 and W-2 uh, in the same year is going to be a huge red flag. That's an easy one for the IRS and for the FTP to find. Um, paying somebody you know, under both ways, under their social is what I'm talking about, going to be a problem because they're going to be in the same tax year. You're going to be issuing a W-2 and a 1099. Another thing we see happen is where people want to sort of test drive an employee before hiring them. And so they say, okay, well, can I pay this person as an independent contractor? And let me just see how they do as a machinist, as one of my clients wants to do. We're going to have them come in for a couple of weeks. We don't want to go through the trouble of hiring them and everything. So we're just going to test drive them, have them be a machinist for a couple of weeks. And then if we like them, we're going to go ahead and hire them. But for those two weeks, we're going to pay them on a 1099. And I have to say, that's an employee. That's not 
a 1099. That's not someone coming to you with their expertise, even if this person is a very skilled machinist, you are controlling the means and method of them performing their work. Uh, another one, and that would actually be true for this as well, classifying some workers as employees and then others who are doing the same work as independent contractors is another huge red flag. We have a transportation company. First person I forwarded the decision in Dynamex to is one of our clients who they have drivers and some of the drivers are workers that they pay W-2. There are other owner-operator drivers that they pay as 1099. Anytime you have two groups of people like that doing the exact same work but paying them differently really really hard to make that a significant distinction from my point of view and i again just a huge red flag um because the worker and company agree to pay as a 1099 means nothing as marla will tell you it doesn't matter you can have the employee sign all sorts of things but as a friend of mine who's another hr consultant says you know an employee cannot uh cannot authorize the company to break the law Okay, so even if you and, and the worker agree that to pay as a 1099, the government doesn't care. It has to do, again, with those different tests that Marla described. Um, the other thing, the first and foremost that they're going to look at is, does the independent contractor have their own business? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but that's one of the things that we would always suggest is make sure that you're paying actually under an employer ID number whenever possible and not paying under a social. Um, I attended a e EDD audit, actually it was the Labor Commissioner audit, take it back, with one of my clients, and I could tell by the list what they were looking for. And it was, they were looking to see if they were misclassifying workers because they were asking for vendor records. And they were looking to see, you know, who are the vendors that you're paying as an independent contractor. So those are just some examples of what comes up on a regular basis for us. And I'm sure there's many, many more if we sat down and thought about it. Uh, the other thing is many times owners tell me or executives tell me that they think they can classify people as independent contractor because either when they were an employee at their former company, it was done that way, or they'll say, well, everyone in the industry does that way. Sort of one of the things Marla mentioned was the unfair trade practice, right? It's, you know, because people go, well, I can't compete with other people in this industry if they're paying people as a 1099 because they're not paying taxes. It's cheaper to them. So my you know, my costs are higher and so it lowers my profit or makes me ineligible to compete. And just because everyone else does it doesn't mean it's legal for you to do it. And the other thing I hear a lot is, well, so-and-so large company does it this way. And that's why I included this next slide to just remind everybody that big companies get it wrong as well. So FedEx actually had a bunch of lawsuits filed, and those of you that have been on our prior independent contractor webinars will remember we talked about this a couple of years ago. Um, so in August 2014, this was a California case, uh, the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco decided against FedEx saying that they had misclassified the drivers of these trucks. So we see this truck. I never knew that these people were once classified as independent contractors. They, they were using their own trucks. They purchased the truck. But the problem is FedEx said, yeah, but you have to wear our uniform. You have to use our electronic platform. You have to deliver the way we want you to deliver the, the products. And so they all came together and said, no, we're really supposed to be drivers. Similarly, in July 2015, the Kansas Supreme Court decided against FedEx on the same issue. That was brought um, on behalf of several different states, actually. And then the Kansas decision was adopted by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And so once all of those three cases were decided against FedEx, FedEx basically caved at that point and said, okay, we're not going to continue to fight this. And they ended up settling those two cases, the first two, for $453 million, okay, almost a half a billion dollars. So I just want to caution everybody when you start thinking about, well, you know, so-and-so big company, they do it this way, that doesn't mean they're right either, and similarly can get tagged in this case for $453 million. So let's look at some of the different types of claims that could potentially come up. So first and foremost, we're going to have some wage and hour claims, right? And that can come from a whole bunch of different ways. So it could be a disgruntled current worker or a terminated former worker. You've been paying them as an independent contractor, and all of a sudden they say, wait a second, I should have been paid as an employee, right? Or I just mentioned the situation with competitors. Maybe a competitor, you know, drops a dime and says, hey, you know, EDD, IRS, labor commission or whatever, um, you know, I think we have a situation going on at this other company. 
where they're not paying people correctly. So it can come up a lot of different ways, but essentially we're going to have an issue if you've been paying them as an independent contractor when you should have been paying them through payroll. Um, that also could lead to wage statement violations, and we've done webinars on this before, but under the labor code, if you're a non-exempt employee, you're entitled to things like minimum wage, meal and rest periods, overtime. You're also entitled to itemized wage statements. Right, And if you're not accurately um, producing wage statements, which you wouldn't be if you're paying them as a 1099, that has penalties with it by itself. Um, you also have to maintain accurate payroll records. If you're not paying them on a W-2 through payroll, you wouldn't have those. And then also there's the issue of timely payment of wages. They, you know, you, If they're non-exempt, you have to pay them semi-monthly, worst case scenario from your point of view, um, and you probably are having them bill you at the end of the month. Right, so there's a problem there, and then also reimbursement for business expenses. So there's a whole bunch of different things that can come up. Um, I'm going to let Marla come back later to the PAGA claims, unlikely for now. I don't remember her mentioning that, and that's something that she can touch on with regard to the ABC test. Um, the other thing that'll come up is there's potential other claims that could be filed besides the wage and hour violations. So, um, and the wage and hour violations, I should mention, could go back as many as four years. So it's not a situation where they go, oh yeah, you made a mistake and going forward, you know, you need to fix it. You could actually go back and be penalized on four years four years of wage and hour violations. So it could be very expensive very quickly. Um, you also have situations where maybe somebody says, I was, you paid me as an independent contractor and you didn't provide me with a 401k plan. You didn't provide me with medical benefits like you were required to do so. So that could be an issue. Unpaid taxes, of course. Unemployment insurance. I had a situation a number of years ago with a client of mine and they're good friends of mine. They actually hired somebody. They never met the person. They had her doing a service of transcription she, I think how this happened is she lost her full-time day job that she worked. She was just doing this work on the side for them. Um, she filed for unemployment and honestly answered the question of, do you have any other sources of income? And she said, yes, you know, I make some money by doing this service for them. I'm paid as a 1099. That triggered an EDD audit. And it cost my friends, my client, tens of thousands of dollars because it was going to be more expensive to fight it and pay attorney's fees, and they decided in the end just to pay it. Um, but that was a that was how it came up there. So it doesn't even have to be someone disgruntled. It could just be something that triggers EDD into looking further. Um, disability insurance, you know, if somebody gets injured off the job, or workers' comp benefits. Another client, same one actually I mentioned, that has outside sales sales reps, right? Uh, Last year, around December, one of them who lives in New York walked outside, slipped and fell in his driveway, called the company and said, I want to file a workers' comp claim. Now what, right? He's not eligible. You're paying him as a 1099. And so that becomes a big issue. And some of those things that you don't think about at the time when you're classifying people that come up to haunt you later. So let's talk about some of the costs of being wrong, you know, first and foremost, there's some financial ones, right? So I talked about just some of the fines and back payments that we would um, be forced to pay for that. Um, if it's found to be intentional, that actually goes up. So you can have some additional fines, penalties, back taxes, everything. But if you look on the right-hand side, the third sub-bullet, you know, it's up to $1,000 in criminal penalties per misclassified employee, and then also up to one year in prison. Um, so there could be potentially criminal penalties. And the note at the bottom says the person responsible for withholding taxes could also be held personally liable for any uncollected tax. So who's the person responsible? Is it the owner? Is it an executive? Is it the payroll clerk? We don't know. Um, and so that's the other thing. Don't be the test case on that, right? You don't want to be the one um, doing this incorrectly and end up being held personally liable. Some other costs of being wrong, as I mentioned, could be benefits, right? There's 401k contributions. There's medical insurance. Maybe stock options you offer your employees that you didn't offer your 1099 when you misclassified them. Um, obviously, this is going to be worse if people think 
if the you know government agencies think that you intentionally tried to avoid benefits. Um, I think there was a case from a long time ago, like 1980s or something, so now I can't even believe 30, 40 years ago, where Microsoft was bringing in software engineers, paying them as a 1099, and it was found that they were intentionally trying to avoid paying benefits, at least that was the allegation. Um, and the last thing in terms of the cost of being wrong is sort of the scarlet letter. And that's like how it's going to affect your reputation. So in California, we have a notice that has to be prominently displayed that's accessible to all employees in the general public. Um, and it has to remain in place for a year. It has to be signed by a corporate officer. And then it has this statement. And it's you have to admit that you have committed a serious violation of the law by engaging in the willful misclassification of employees and then it goes you have to put that up you have to note that the notice is being posted pursuant to a state order so everybody knows it's a big scarlet L um, and you have to have that up for a year so think about how that's going to play with your customers with your vendors with candidates for employment who come in and see that um, it's not something that I know I would ever want uh, to have happen for me okay Moving on to some best practices. So let's talk about some of the things that you can do. Okay, first and foremost, you need to make a good faith effort to properly classify everyone, right? We make the same discussion when we talk about exempt versus non-exempt, right? Another different classification issue. You want someone to come in and do the analysis. So definitely contact me or Marla. We can come in, we can take a look at everything and make the best, best analysis we can and also give you some guidance on, okay, well, there's gray area here, but here's what we would do in order to do the best you can to protect yourself from a misclassification charge, right? And you definitely want to document the analysis that supports that IC classification. So if you do that analysis and you say, okay, this is why I think this person should be considered an independent contractor, then document that right? Make notes on all of that so you can recall your thinking when you went through it and how you're supporting that decision. If you do have an independent contractor, you must obtain a form W-9 from each contractor. Even if you don't have to issue the 1099, like I'm a corporation, so if I'm working with your company, you don't have to issue me a 1099 because I have my own business, but you need to get a form W-9 from me so you have that record. And then also make sure that you have an agreement that requires the independent contractor to do a few things. One, provide proof of a license if applicable, right? So if they are required to have some sort of proof of a license, um, they're a CPA, they're a doctor, they're you know, a civil engineer, whatever it is, um, provide proof of a license, provide proof of liability insurance, and if they have employees, workers' comp insurance, right? Never let anybody bring their employees onto your site unless they have workers' comp insurance. And then also represent and warrant that they have a separate business. Okay, so again, that would go back up to that documentation. You're like, look, they came to me, they told me they had a separate business, and I went so far as to get a copy of some documentation or at least some representation and warranty that they have a separate business. All of that will help you. Um, you know, if you have to defend the decision later. Some other things you want to do is make sure that you're using language and actions to separate employees from my from independent contractors. So going back to the example I used a second ago of a company that has two, um, you know, two sets of drivers, right? Some independent owned and operated and some that are employees. Well, don't make them all put you know, your values on the side of the truck, your logo on the side of the truck, wear uniforms or shirts that have your logo on it. That's going to be a huge red flag, right? Don't issue them business cards that have, you know, their name on one of your business cards if they have their own business, right? Also be careful with your language. I, I don't ever say I hire an independent contractor or employ an independent contractor. Either you contract with them or you engage them or something like that. So you want to make sure that you're clear in your language. And I people people mix up those words all the time. Um, so you want to be really clear and you keep that really solid line down the two columns, right? And talk about employees one way, talk about independent contractors a different way. Take a look to see if they have, um, if you have insurance that you could get to protect you. Now, EPLI coverage, Employer Practices Liability Insurance, is not going to cover wage and hour claims or intentional acts. Okay, they can't, they can't settle that for you or pay any sort of penalty. But you may be able to buy additional coverage to provide a defense for those. And this is how this may play out if 
if the insurance carrier thinks, well, we're gonna we're on the hook for defense costs, and this trial is gonna go on forever, or you know, we're just gonna be racking up bills, they may actually then have some sort of incentive to settle that claim on your behalf, because again, the cost of settling the claim is gonna be less than the cost of defending the claim. So you might wanna talk to your insurance broker, and if you don't have one, I'm happy to introduce you. Uh, to many that, that provide this type of insurance, but go to your commercial insurance broker, ask about any sort of defense cost insurance that you might be able to uh, buy. And then worst case scenario, err on the side of classifying the worker as an employee, because then you know for sure you're not gonna be running into uh, these type of issues. It's gonna cost you more, Short term, for sure, but it may provide um, a better situation for you than if it's found down the road, you know, that you've been misclassifying workers. And with that, I'm going to ask Marla to jump back on the call because what we thought we would do is take a look at a couple scenarios that are fairly common. And what I thought we would do is have Marla just sort of walk through where there are red flags for each of these bullet points how she thinks um, the court or government agency may look at these situations. And while we're going through these, if you have any questions that you want to bring up, again, we can't make a, you know, we can't do an analysis over the phone on a set of facts you're going to give us and tell you, yes, that person's good. But if you want to ask some questions, get clarity about the case, ask about any best practices or something, just type it in on your dashboard that you have. Um, you can put it in where it says questions or um, the chat feature, just put it in down there and then Denise is going to take a look at those and we'll get to them in just a minute. So Marla, um, on these I've got a couple of scenarios that these are pretty typical things that come up. So I've got a couple of urgent care clinics that I'm working with as clients, right? Um, in this in this scenario I'm going to give you, you know, they have employees, right? They have receptionists, they have medical assistants, they have x-ray techs, they have hourly employees, they have salaried employees, right? They also have providers, which is the term that's used in that world, who are doctors, that are incorporated and paid as 1099s. And in most cases in this particular client situation, they work at other, they work at hospitals too. So they're not only working for this clinic, they work someplace else. They have an outside bookkeeper that does their accounting. She's paid as a 1099. She has other clients, but she's not incorporated, okay? And then there's a part-time independent contractor who comes in to do some medical tests, some specialty tests that are that help what they do, right? In the type of stuff they do, but um, it's sort of the one-offs, right? This person's got is actually psychological testing that helps what the clinic does, but it's not something they do on a regular basis. So they bring somebody in and pay that person as a 1099. So can you just sort of shed some light on? Your thoughts on this, where are the red flags and what can people do to try to lower their exposure? Sure, so the employees obviously are no question. We're, we're safe with them right. and that's a, a comment to always err on the side of, of, of the least risk if you're that type of, of employer and most of my clients are. If we're unsure, even under the old tests, uh, whether the status is or the classification is proper as an independent contractor, but I have many employers who say, I don't want to take the chance because as Linda pointed out, the, the, the penalties are very high. So the doctors that are providers that are incorporated and paid as 1099s, you know, the issue here, of course, goes to the, you know, this is in the usual course of the hiring business. They're doing, they're providing the same work, I'm sure, as the employees, um, medical services, you know, urgent care, maybe none of the employees are doctors, so maybe we have that wrinkled twist in there that no, this is something different, not the usual course, but that would, I think that would be a hard argument. Their best argument here with the doctors is that they're incorporated as a separate business, and under Dynamics, as I said, that, that was individual workers, and the court did not address entities um, and the work being done by an entity, and, and why that makes a difference, again, I want to go back to the very first page and second page of the the case discussed this is about money and who's paying for unemployment taxes and who's paying social security and who's paying workers comp and who's paying all those obligations that an employer pays and if you have an entity that that's engaging these these doctors they are presumably paying that so we may see and expect hopefully to see that the courts will fall um, with entities and say, no, nope, that, that burden to society that we're worried about is, is being taken care of by the entity. So we're going to allow that to be an independent contractor. Um, an outside bookkeeper to do accounting as a 1099, 
she has other clients but is not incorporated well you know again we have an argument here that it's that's not our usual course of business our business as we advertise on our website and on our t-shirts is we're providing urgent care and on our business cards she's providing accounting services what would definitely be better if she was incorporated even if she doesn't have any other clients it would be better if she's incorporated if this was the only client um, the fact that she has other clients is still going to help and then the part-time independent contractor who comes in as a one-off uh, and when you say that, Linda, I'm assuming that they're performing the same services as the employees, and I think that one is just not it's going to fail. That's going to have to be reclassified as an employee. So what if that person that's coming in to do some medical tests, though, are doing a, like a specialty test that nobody else in the clinic has the ability to do? They just don't need it a lot. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's such a perfect, that's the perfect question to ask because as I pointed out earlier, that's the exact analysis the court did not give us. Well, yes, our usual course is, you could say, is so broad that it's any medical services, or you can say it's only the medical services that we provide, and we don't provide that particular. So for, let's say, for example, you have someone who comes in to do ultrasounds, and the urgent care doesn't have its own ultrasound machine, this person brings its own machine. What, where does that fall? And the answer to that is, right. I don't know. I don't right. know. So, And we don't know, because we didn't get any direction from the court in 82 pages. We didn't get any direction from the court at all, other than... Uh, we're going to look to other states. So we haven't, since uh, April, done that deep dive yet um, into the other states. As we start doing analysis for our clients um, on, on current classifications, anybody who has an independent contractor, if we have something like that, we'll dive into uh, um, the other states and see if we can find analysis. Yeah, and I would also add, isn't it true, like part of the analysis, and maybe this goes back to the Borrello test or the other one, um, but part of that analysis is, is the person that's coming in part time, you know, are they deciding how they're performing that work? Is there direction being given to that person by, you know, the management or doctors at the urgent care clinic? Or are, is this person coming in the one that has the expertise? Well, so yes, and that goes to um, item A of the three ABC right. test. And that, all of that would go to A. So that would, that would be very favorable for the A part. Um, and and also, if they're doing it for other urgent cares, you know, I go around to independent urgent cares and I provide this service, that will take care of the C part. Um, and right. I own my machine. You know, that goes to the C part. But it's the, the part B. And remember, all parts, A, B, and C, have to be proved, and they have to be proved by the employer. I want to point out that the ABC test, the version that was adopted by the court was the Massachusetts version. So if we're going to look to other states for direction, that's where we would go first. Um, although they did pull uh, cases from other states as well. I also want to point out something about the unfair competition. My, one of my um, clients that came in, just as Linda pointed out, came in from an EDD audit. They, and this was oh, 20 years ago. And the EDD audited them because they had a disgruntled employee and determined, you know, you've got all these workers that we think you've misclassified as independent contractors. And they're all employees. And they came in and we did an analysis under the old Borello test. And sure enough, I said, I have to agree with the EDD. This, these are clearly employees. And the comment was, as Linda pointed out, often is, well, everybody else in my industry is doing it this way. And I said, that doesn't make it right. Even if you have big players like FedEx in your industry, it doesn't make it correct. But what the EDD made very clear to my clients was, we want the, the playing field to be level. We want the competition to be level. And, and also, let's be honest, they want the, the, the funds. I'm not trying to make this political. Uh, we have enough of that going on today. Uh, we want the funds. So they said, let us know who your competition is. We will go audit them. So you can be a little bit of a whistleblower here if you feel your your industry has unfair competition because you know there are, are small, big, medium players, whoever, out there that are, are, are misclassifying. And so they're bidding projects lower than you or they're they're, they're their products or services are lower than you because they're improperly classifying. You can report them to the EDD and you can do it confidentially if you want. Great. And before we go into the second scenario, Marla, I want you to go back to the second bullet for providers, doctors. Um, so one of the things that I just touched on, but I said I wanted you to come back on, back in and talk about is PAGA claims. So one of the unique um, points in the analysis of the Dynamex case has to do with PAGA claims and whether or not in this case we even have to worry about the ABC test for uh, types of 
potentially employees who are not subject to the wage orders. Can you just touch on that briefly? I'm going to touch on it very briefly because I'm not a PAGA expert. My litigation department is, and perhaps that's a great uh, topic for uh, another webinar, PAGA itself. But I will say that I, I, I mentioned the the Orange County Superior Court case that, that found that Dynamex was retroactive. In that case, which was a PAGA case also, um, that that court went out of its way to say that labor code, the violations of the labor code require compliance with the wage orders so that the ABC test should be applied. So it was applied in a PAGA case, but it was also securitists, I'm not using the word correctly, came around and said labor code violations. He, he specifically said, the judge specifically said, labor code requires you to comply with the wage orders. Therefore, the ABC test applies to the labor code. Now, this is a lower court, which means it's not dispositive, but that tells you how most of us, when we go to court, we end up in the lower court. We don't get it to the appellate level or to the California Supreme Court. That gives you an indication of how these lower court courts might react to this. And then unless we get statutes that change it or unless it goes up to the appellate or, or the um, California Supreme Court, that's what we're going to have. Okay, great. Let's take a look at the second one. So software consulting company, this was actually emailed to me last night. Um, they use independent contractors to work on misplaced projects off-site, he said, when they have too much work. And then they also, um, they outsource uh, work to India when they get busy. You know, are any red flags there on either of those two line items for you? On all of them. Okay. <laughs> or on both of them, I guess, on both of them. There's not all of them, both of them. Because it, if it's the usual course, now here's where it's different. So I'm a law firm. I'm clearly not in the software business. But I might engage a software company to come in and, and build a software program for me that allows me to do better client management. Um, that's, that, that's an easy one. It's like the plumber and the electrician. The harder part here is is what is it that they're doing, and is that part of their usual course of business, and how do we define that usual course of business? And that goes back to the same analysis we were doing with the urgent care. Right, because like on that first bullet, I mean, I would liken it to my situation, right? So in years gone by, when we got super busy on recruiting projects, I would engage um, a recruiter as an independent contractor to come in and help. We don't tell her how to do the work. We would just you know, say, this is what we need done. Go source you know, candidates or whatever it would be, right? This year, based on Dynamics, I said, I can't do that anymore. I've got to put you on payroll, right? Because I want to take a more conservative approach because what she's doing is integral to what we're doing. I don't think, I think we would flunk part B, right? I think so, you would, You. I think you would too. Right. So we went ahead and put her on payroll. So yeah, I do have concerns about that first bullet point. The second one, outsourcing work to India. Um, let's talk about that for a little bit, because like I was saying to you before we started, you know, I have been on the Upwork platform, right, which is freelancers. I don't even have contact information for the freelancers that are designing some business cards for me right now. Um, I pay through that platform, right? So I feel pretty good. I feel like, okay, I've got a little bit of a buffer there. Um, you know, I went through this company, this Upwork.com company, and put it out to bid and found some people that wanted to do some work. Cool? Well, in your situation, it... it it sounds like what you're hiring the, the worker to do or the entity to do is outside the usual course of your business. Your business is consulting. Definitely. Um, but I thought in the software when they were outsourcing work that they do. Okay, okay. And that's the case. That's going to be the test. So let me just very briefly touch on the expenses issue that uh, in Dynamex that I mentioned um, that the, the claims of the two drivers were um, – wage an hour, obviously, for because of the misclassification, but also reimbursement of expenses, which was under the labor code. And the reason why the court did not address that, whether that was covered under the ABC test and specifically said the ABC test only applies to the wage order claims is because the lower court ruled that it was Borrello and the attorneys did not appeal that part of the case. They only appealed the decision to apply Borrello to uh, the wage and hour claims under the the wage orders. So that's why we don't know and have this horrible, you know, 
void uh, on the labor code and do we apply it? A Borello, which is what the Dynamics says at this point we do, but we have this Orange County Superior Court case that says, nah, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to tuck it all in and say that all labor code violations, you know, because the wage order is a labor code violation, if you're not complying with it, we're going to apply the ABC test. I think that's ultimately where it's going to go. Okay. All right, great. And I just want to circle back just to be clear, because I felt like I didn't um, fully get an answer to the outsource work to India. If they're also seeing work, even if it's what they do, but they're outsourcing it to a company in India, and they're paying a company, almost like a temp agency, then you would have no problem with that, correct? I, I wouldn't. At this point, I wouldn't have a problem with it, if it's an entity of some kind. Okay, awesome. Okay, with that, Denise, I'm going to turn it back over to you to see if we have any questions out there that need to be answered. Okay, great. Uh, thanks to both of you for this. Obviously, it is a topic that has, still has a lot of questions that are unresolved. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask our panel, you can write it now in the Q&A section. I see we do have some questions, but they're very specific, and I know we can't address a specific question. So um, let's go to, someone had a question. Uh, Marla, you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, while you were going through the, the ABC test, that the EDD has its own test. Is there a difference between the EDD test and the ABC test? Is one better than the other? Um, what should I consider? Well, um, the, the EDD test is different. Um, it, it, I don't know if they will now change their their testing and say, well, we're going to follow Dynamax, because the court doesn't say that they have to. The court says this only applies in claims that arise under wage, under the wage orders. That the, the Dynamax court is very specific. This only applies in claims arising under the wage orders. But the EDD's test, um, I don't know who's asking the question, but if you email me, I can I can send it to you. Or you may even be able to find it online at the EDD. It was, it was a yes and no test. Like, a, a, ask these questions. If you a, answer yes to any of the above questions, then, then it's an employee. And if you answer no to any of the below questions, then it's an employee. Now, which one's better? It, it's not your choice. <laughs> you don't get to choose one. So if the EDD will use what it, it wants to use until a court or a statute orders them to use something in particular. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, Linda, one quick clarification. Um, you were speaking about uh, big companies and just because everyone does it, uh, we shouldn't do it or as a, as a company, uh, we shouldn't do just think that we can do things the same thing that the bigger companies can do. Um, you mentioned you were talking about test drives for uh, employees. Uh, can you review again what the um, statute of limitations is or how far back that they can go for violations? Uh, there's a person who has written in that they have done this uh, two years ago and they're concerned. Should they be concerned? They should be concerned. If they did it for only a short period of time, then obviously you're, you know, any sort of penalties are going to be limited to that period of time. So if you're test driving somebody for two weeks before you decide to hire them, you know, you, you have unpaid you know, payroll taxes for two weeks only. So even though they could potentially go back a four-year period and look, I mean, I don't know, Marla, you tell me, but I would think that, you know, slim and none that you're going to get caught two years later on something that happened for two weeks, two years ago. Um, but the possibility exists, right? If it's something that you started two years ago and you're continuing to do, stop it now, <laughs> right? <laughs> and please, going forward, definitely don't do that. I mean, it's, that is a, I mean, that is an employee, Right, you don't bring people into your company with the intent of hiring them down the road, but say I want to test drive them and pay them as an independent contractor. Um, I mean that that's such a clear violation that you will at some point probably get tagged for that. Okay, great. Linda, I, I think that's a great place to to remind everybody if you are if you have any independent contractors that you're that you're using, please reach out to Linda to us to another attorney or consulting service and, and do an analysis so that at least you know what your exposure is. Yeah, and the first, I mean, the first thing, and I've been told this and I've experienced this firsthand with clients, the first thing they look at, you know, in, in the cases I've been involved with is, you know, does this person have their own business? And if they have their own business, then EDD 
has a greater propensity to just walk away and go, oh, okay. That they may not stop there, but that is like the first thing that they're going to take a look at. If if um, the person does not have their own business, now you're going to go through a whole bunch of different questions about it, right? But when I was with one of my clients, and this was before the labor commissioner's office, you know. I told you earlier, I knew what they were looking for just based on the questions and the documents they wanted produced by the client. And when I looked at this, I said, have you guys been misclassifying independent contractors? Because it was clear they wanted, you know, they wanted a record of all the vendors that they paid. Um, the, the list that got produced was really interesting because the report out of the accounts payable department actually had like the person or company listed the name of the company if there was a company and then there was a place that either had the employer ID number the EIN or the social security number if you're paying an independent contractor under a social security number it is a huge red flag and what was interesting in that case there were both on that list and I walked into that hearing thinking oh my god you're in so much trouble because they're gonna take one look at this and they're gonna say wait a second you have an accountant that comes in on a regular basis like 20 30 hours a week that you're paying under a social through accounts payable that to me you know, I, I was, was like, you guys are going down. I mean, that was my, my self-talk, right? And what happened in this case is this um, officer looked at the list. He had my business card in front of him. He saw me on the list and he said, oh, this is you. And I said, right, you know, I provide, you know, human resources consulting to this client. And he said, oh, and you're a company. I said, yeah, I have my own business. And then he took the list and set it aside. They were super lucky in my opinion that they got out of that because Anytime you know you see something like that, you see you're paying an individual under their social. I, I just think you're you're in so much trouble if you don't get that fixed. So that going back to the questioner before about EDD's test, I would start with that. Look to see if you're paying any individual through accounts payable under their social, because that's going to be the first red flag. Okay, great. Uh, the rest of the questions that we have are too specific, so I will follow up with uh, you and Marla and provide those to you so that you can get back to the people who have asked these questions. And so, Linda, I want to turn it over to you for wrapping up today. Yes, thank you, Denise, and thank you, Marla, for all of your insight, as always. Um, so, again, our contact information is up here. Feel free to reach out to us if we didn't answer your question. We can't just do an you know, analysis for you um, over the phone or via email. We'd have to take a look at a lot of different things. Um, but if you want to talk to about having us come in, we're happy to do that. Um, we are looking at the date for October uh, for scheduling the next webinar and also for topics. If you have a topic that you would like us to do a webinar on, please, please, please email me and let me know that because we're happy to do it. We're always looking for topics. Um, so just reach out to me and just say, hey, I've got an idea. This is what I'd like to know more about. Um, if there's anything that you would like, please, please, please just suggest it to us. All right. And with that, uh, Thank you everyone for attending today. I hope you I hope this provided you with some great insight uh, and help with your independent contractor classification. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you everyone.